Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Melanie McKinney, Programs and Special Events Coordinator for Can Do Multiple Sclerosis. Thank you for acting on the belief that you are more than your MS by attending tonight's webinar, Adaptive Equipment, How It Can Help You Exercise, presented by Julianne hansen Zlatev, Occupational Therapist, and Kathy San Martino, Physical Therapist. Can Do MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people living with MS and their support partners. We empower people to move beyond their MS by giving them the knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors, actively co-manage their disease, and live their best lives. Please visit the Can Do MS website, www.mscando.org, where you can register for upcoming webinars and view our archived webinars, check out our Can Do MS Lifestyle Empowerment programs, including Can Do, Take Charge, Jumpstart, and Jumpstart in Motion programs. You can share your Can Do promise, and you can also learn ways you can contribute to or get involved with Can Do MS. And now a few items before we get started this evening. Questions and comments will be addressed at the end of the presentation, and we will answer as many questions as we can get to within the allotted time. You can post your questions by typing in the chat feature, which is located on the left of your computer screen. To submit a question, type in the small box that says chat with presenters. And you can listen to the live webinar through your computer speakers rather than having to call in. This presentation, like all of our presentations, is being recorded and will be archived on CanDoMS's website. You can view them again at any time. And you can also view the webinar schedule and register for upcoming webinars. Those of you who attend live this evening, you'll receive an email with copies of tonight's PowerPoint presentation. And please also complete the evaluation at the end of the webinar. We value everyone's feedback. And now to tell you a little bit about the two great speakers we have with us for tonight's webinar. Julianne hansen Zlatev has been an occupational therapist for 18 years. Over the past 15 years, she has specialized in neurological and neuro neurodegenerative diagnoses with an emphasis on stroke recovery, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease symptom manage management and Huntington's disease. Her special interest is restoring quality of movement while maximizing independent and wellness in daily activities. This has led her to study myofascial release as a unique and holistic treatment option for many individuals. Julianne has worked with the Rocky Mountain MS Center for many years as a consultant for the Rehabilitation Clinic and for Can Do MS for nine years. She currently owns a private practice in Castle Rock, Colorado, and she enjoys working with individuals to achieve movement and balance in their daily lives. And Kathy San Martino has been a physical therapist since 1984, and she specializes in treating patients with neurological diagnoses, including MS. She has worked in acute care rehab, home care, and outpatient settings. Since 2000, she has worked at Casa Colina Rehab Center in Pomona, California, where she is an outpatient clinical coordinator. She works with a no local neurologist in a weekly MS clinic, and she runs the MS wellness programs for the local National MS Society. She also directs the wheelchair and seating clinic, and she recently joined the Can Do MS staff uh, about a year ago. And before we start the presentation, we want to learn a little bit more about you. And I just put a survey up on the screen, and we'd like to know um, if, just if you're a person living with MS or a support partner um, or maybe a healthcare professional. It looks like we have some others on the call. That's great. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to answer. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Julianne and to Kathy. All right, thank you so much, Mel, and welcome tonight, everyone who uh, is on the call with us. Uh, Kathy and I also had a little survey that we would, we hope you guys would like to fill out for us. We just wanted to know um, how much time do you currently spend exercising each week? That way, uh, we can kind of get a feel for what's happening in your daily life right now. This is Julianne, by the way, um, and we will be talking about. Okay, good. I'm watching your responses come in. So that looks good. Thank you very much. Okay. 
So I'm going to be talking about occupational therapy. And I started with the slide, um, Tools for the Job of Living, um, because that is a great deal of what occupational therapy really is. A number of years ago, the Occupational Therapy Association came up with that as their, as their slogan, and I liked it so much that I went ahead to use it tonight. Oops, sorry, I'm jumping ahead on the screen. So what can an occupational therapist do for you? Well, our main goal in working with you is to maximize independence in daily activity. Um, an occupational therapist is going to take a unique and holistic view of your daily life and, and see how successful we can help people become in all the little things that add up to matter and in the bigger things. So really helping to rebalance the, the, uh, the whole of your life so that it is satisfactory and successful to you. What we can do is help you discover resources in your community. So an occupational therapist should have some knowledge about local classes or, uh, so say, a yoga class that with someone who specializes with people who have MS or um, uh, uh, pools that have uh, lifts, lifts that help people get in and out of pools or just local exercise physiologists that might uh, specialize or have a, have a good knowledge of how to exercise in a particular way. So checking in with an OT is a good way to see what your community has to offer. And an OT will also help you assess how you use your body and how you position yourself to do things all throughout your day. So whether, how, whether we're talking with you about how you get in and out of bed, to how you do your cooking, to how you sit at your desk and perform your job, or even to how you drive, we might have some ideas for how to, to modify that or improve on that so that you use less energy in the task and so that it maximizes your ability to be independent or strong with that. In that regard, we can assess and recommend the need for tools and adaptive equipment. I usually like to say that uh, occupational therapists are tool kings and queens because if there's been something made if someone has had a problem with uh, doing something, they've been very clever about it, and there are a lot of resources and tools out there, which of course is what we're talking about tonight. And then we can also talk about assessing environmental changes and adaptations, and those things can be um, as little as, you know what, I think uh, putting a shower chair in your shower would be really useful to make sure that you get a, high, a chair that adjusts higher so that you're, you're closer to your desk and your computer to, you know, if you've got the time and the money, blowing out and having your dream bathroom would be a good idea. So we can, uh, we can make recommendations that are both large and small to help you out. So where can you meet occupational therapists? Well, there's a variety of places that we work. Um, home health agencies are a, a good way. Um, to, find, to find us. Um, you can find OTs in rehab units and hospitals and skilled nursing facilities. They also work in acute care in hospitals. Uh, you can find us in outpatient rehab centers. Um, usually uh, the National MS Society or your local MS chapters will have an idea of occupational therapists in your community that you can contact. And last but not least, um, occupational therapists are in school systems. And if you happen to have a child in the school system and you see an OT, you can ask, hey, do you know anybody who specializes in, in MS care or has some special knowledge with that? And, and some, we're a pretty tight-knit community, and, and sometimes they can uh, uh, connect you in with somebody. Probably the easiest way to find an OT is to get a referral from your physician, either your primary care doctor or a neurologist or physiatrist. And uh, that's probably the easiest way to find one of us. But I did want to tell you about some of that. So as I mentioned before, there are hundreds of choices um, for adaptations and tools that you can use, even just for exercise. And really since that is the topic tonight, that's really what we're going to, to talk about mostly. Um, I don't have any pictures on my slides because Kathy has such tremendous pictures later on. Um, and I can talk a little bit more in question and answer later if you have some questions about these. But with, there's all kinds of things out there to help. There's tons of choices for hand exercising for both strength and coordination. You can use pulleys to exercise shoulders. 
um, TheraBand and TheraTubing, which is this really cool kind of sticky substance that you can use for fingers, your hands. You can use it for your arms and your legs and your torso for strengthening or stretching. There are loop attachments, so if, if sustaining a grasp on any of those things or your, your exercise equipment is difficult, why then um, you can have a loop attachment. Therapy balls or physio balls are amazing. And, and over the years, I've, I've come to, to have a better appreciation for how many, how many ways you can exercise with a physio ball. Um, you can stretch. You can get a cardiac exercise on them. Aerobic exercise, rather, sounds better. Um, you can uh, work on your balance with physio balls. So they're really an amazing tool. There's such a thing as pedal exercises and hand bikes. If, if keeping your feet in bike pedals is challenging, so you can still get a, a, a good aerobic exercise. There are stretch assists, and there's some, some pictures coming up about those later. There's such a thing as a sit-to-stand exerciser. Um, really, it's a, it's a tool used to help someone if they're having trouble with coming from sit-to-stand, and you can use it as an exercise device to help strengthen your legs and your trunk. There are these little pods that look like they used to have them on the Price, of right, price is Right, and you, they lift them up to reveal a prize. These little balance pods that you can put under your hands and your feet to challenge your balance a little bit, which are really kind of cool. There's TheraPutty, which probably most people have heard about. And um, it's kind of like Silly Putty, but it's a little more resilient, and I think it smells better. And then there's such a thing as BOSU Balance Trainer, which is like a physio ball cut in half. And you can use that uh, for really uh, tremendous um, balance training. So really, the bigger question is when to consider adapted equipment. And that's probably the, the question that I get the most frequently. And my best advice would be when an exercise or an activity produces extreme fatigue with a poor recovery from that fatigue, so after you've done the exercise and, and the fatigue is really severe and it overrides the, the beneficial effects of the exercise and that doesn't change, it's not as a result of deconditioning, it doesn't change over time, then that's usually a cue that the exercise itself, the, the performance of that exercise might benefit from some tuning up or some modification. Um, so that's a good time to, to, to raise your hand and go, hey, is there something that could make this easier? If you absolutely dread the logistics of performing the exercise or activity, it might be an indication that something needs to be modified um, so that it can be, be easier to access for you. Um, if you can't perform the exercise or activity without assistance, you actually may be able to do it independently if you use um, an adaptation or a tool. Um, so it's definitely worth asking. And if a far part of your body or a distal part of your body is weaker than the near part, say your hand is weaker than your shoulder, then it might be a good time to bring in adaptive equipment or tools. And an example of that would really be if it's hard to sustain a grasp on your exercise equipment, say either a dumbbell or on one of the pulley machines or, or what have you, having one of those loop attachments can really be helpful in sustaining your grasp so that you can continue to do the beneficial exercise. And just as an aside, because stories are always more interesting than facts, um, I had a client who um, had set up in his basement a really beautiful exercise area, gym, bike, you know, the whole nine yards. It was really perfect for him. And he really uh, enjoyed using it and, and got a lot of benefit from his exercise equipment, but it was in the basement. And so he had to go up and down stairs to access it. And over time, that became a challenge for him. And um, he really struggled with, you know, I really need to go down and exercise, but, you know, I have to tackle those stupid stairs and it just wipes me out. And so he kind of quit exercising. Um, over time, he, he decided to put in a stair glide. And that made it easy again. So he was able to go hop hop on the stair glide, go down the stairs, no problem, access his exercise equipment, 
and um, have a really good session and then hop back on the stair glide and go back upstairs. He didn't have to waste any energy on the stairs that he could then use in his exercise equipment room. So that's kind of an example of, of when to think about um, exercise equipment and you know, in conjunction with how it can help me get to exercise. So the next screen is I just have a few resources listed here. Um, some of these, like the North Coast and the Salmons, Preston Rollion, are big um, magazines um, that have a lot of equipment. So it's not just exercise equipment. And it's almost stunning um, how much you have to choose from. So if you go on there and you're like, oh my word, I have no idea what to choose, um, that might be a good time to consult with a physical or occupational therapist. Uh, the Right Stuff and ADL Solutions have some really nice choices on their websites. And it's also nice to check with your local MS Society or chapter for local resources. Um, many times people will, if someone no longer uses their, their stationary bike or they, they don't use a trike anymore, um, they may be willing to, to uh, donate it through the local MS chapter. And then if you know about what you want and you have a really good idea of what you want, Craigslist and eBay and, and local ads are, are good ways to find equipment for uh, less money. Um, with that said, I am going to thank you for your time. I'll catch up with you guys at the end uh, with any questions, if you have any for me. And I will turn it over to Kathy. Hello, everyone. This is Kathy. Um, so we, too, have um, – oh, never mind. The survey's later on in my talk. So anyway, <laughs> what I'd like to start with – is why exercise? I sometimes have to remind myself not all my patients are excited about exercise as I am. So one of the big reasons why it's important to exercise if you have MS is that we know MS is going to bring one down a peg every now and then when you get sick, when you have exacerbations, etc. So it's important to start out at a higher level of fitness. So you want to think of exercise as building a savings account. And it's helpful to build up your reserve of strength, balance, cardiorespiratory endurance in preparation for potential future exacerbations. So the benefits of exercise. No one can unfortunately guarantee what benefits you'll get from exercise, but research has shown that there are many very probable uh, benefits that you'll receive. One is that exercise will most likely improve your ability to get around. Um, it will probably decrease your risk of falls. It will decrease your pain. Um, exercise may also decrease your fatigue level. If you're stronger, then you're going to wear out a lot less quickly. Um, exercise has been found to help with depression and anxiety issues. Exercise has also been found to slow the progression of cognitive changes. Um, we know exercise can help improve sleep patterns um, and also prevent other secondary health problems. So what should be in an exercise program? Well, what everyone's always told is that when you exercise, you should include flexibility, in other words, stretching exercises. Um, usually it's helpful to have a warm-up exercise before you start exercising and then after the fact do some actual stretching of your muscles. Especially as we get older, our muscles are just innately more um, tight. And so we have to put a little more work into that. And then if, if someone has MS and spasticity, again, it's also very important to focus, do, put some focus on stretching exercises. Um, it's also important to have strength training component to your exercise program. And then what's rather unique for someone with MS as opposed to the general population is your exercise program should also include some sort of balance and vestibular retraining um, because that's also a, a part of our mobility issues that um, can also be built up with exercise. And also uh, it's important to incorporate uh, endurance training or cardio training. Ah, here it is. So our survey question, the other survey question we would like to ask is how confident are you in adapting um, your present exercise routine? So 
Most people have some degree of confidence, um, so hopefully we can improve upon those numbers with this, with this lecture. So first of all, ideas for flexibility, uh, stretching exercises, different adaptive equipment that can be used. Um, what's presented, what the picture that is here is called a TheraBand stretch strap. And that can help you, for example, if you're in a sitting position, the multiple loops can help you loop around your foot so you can access your foot and stretch your ankle and your entire leg a little easier. But for low-tech, cheaper options, you could, include, you could try a belt, a towel, or even a dog leash. Some other higher tech options for flexibility is positioning devices. So if you don't have the ability to perform stretches and you don't want to burn your caregiver, your partner with one more thing to do, um, you can consider a device that just positions you, your joint, in a stretch position. Um, so what's pictured here are two options for the ankle, but there's options for pretty much any joints. So the top one is um, a jazz ankle splint. And you can see the person's hand is on a knob, and that knob can change the angle as your ankle stretches out. So this is something that could be worn half hour at a time or so in the evening. The bottom one is a multi-potus system, sometimes called a prefo. And it can be used in bed. Uh, you can see underneath the heel, the metal frame of it kind of droops down. And what that's meant to do is suspend your heel. So this also can double as a way of protecting your heel when you're laying down in bed. Um, so this also positions your foot in an upright position because when we're laying down, generally our foot flops um, down into a downward position, and that can feed into tightness and spasticity. Both of these should be covered by most insurances, especially Medicare, so it would require a physician's uh, prescription. Other positioning device options. Um, the top one is a hip abductor wedge, which is often seen used in the hospital for patients who get total hip replacements uh, to keep their legs apart. So this is something that's rather low in cost um, and can be obtained in some of the um, catalogs that Julianne mentioned. And the picture below is another option for uh, a brace, a splint, and it's called a dynasplint. The jazz splint placed you in a static position of stretch. The dynasplint um, actually has spring-loaded joints to it, so it's more dynamic stretch. And this is a sample of what their knee braces look like. But again, um, dynasplints are available for most joints, and that also could be available through a prescription. Also, the, another option is if you are in a power wheelchair, then you can use the option of a power elevating leg rest to stretch your legs as well. Some other devices that are out there are standing tables. Now, this is where it gets really tricky in terms of getting insurance reimbursement. Um, Medicare generally does not pay for standing tables, and many uh, private insurances will often not pay for standing tables, but it's very important to know exactly what your insurance states in terms of coverage for durable medical equipment, and sometimes a good letter from a physical therapist can justify a standing table. Because um, we know standing tables can also be helpful in terms of um, skin care because you're getting pressure off your bottom if you're sitting in a wheelchair all the time. And also it can help with um, GI issues, bowel bladder issues, etc. But a standing table can be a rather efficient way of dealing with flexibility and spasticity. Um, because you're stretching multiple joints at the same time. Also, especially when it comes to your ankle joints, nothing is more effective than putting your whole body weight down through that ankle to uh, stretch it out. Also, research has found that standing, that joint compression, can also relax some spasticity and give you some spasticity relief for a few hours at a time. So these are two samples of um, standing tables that are on the market. Strengthening equipment. 
So if you're unable to physically hold a weight, there are Velcro options. Um, so the top picture is actually a picture of adjustable weights. You probably can see there are those uh, black slugs basically. And this top weight is, goes from anywhere from 1 to 10 pounds, I believe. So depending on if you just want a 1 pound weight, then you would take most of those black pegs out of out of their little um, slots there. Or if you wanted 10 pounds, then you'd have all 10 in the slot. And that can Velcro onto a limb. Um, then also, Julianne had mentioned TheraBand or Thera2, but it's not a really great picture. But in the bottom picture, a woman has some Thera2 attached to a frame. But you can attach those um, TheraBand or Thera tubes to um, door frames, doorknobs, whatever. And they come in different colors, which stands for different degrees of resistance. The nice thing about TheraBands or Thera tubes, too, is that you can take it and travel with you if you really want to keep exercising when you're on the road. Um, then you can also put a little loop on the end of the TheraBand or the Thera tube. So, again, if you can't physically hold it, you can just loop your hand through um, that loop. If you're trying to exercise your legs, for example, in bed, um, and you find that you can't lift your leg against gravity, and sometimes even the friction of the bed sheet uh, can be too much, then some low-tech options are the top picture is of a slide board. Uh, so just basically a, a slick piece of wood to stretch um, to allow eliminate friction as you move. And then even lower tech is a cookie sheet or a um, pizza sheet, just something flat, metal, metal or wood, so you're, you can eliminate friction altogether. Other options. Exercise certainly can be even more fun when you add a Wii to it. So if you have a Wii at home, there are multiple games that can be done from a sitting position. And you can make it even more of an exercise if you want to by, by adding weights to your arms. And you can also encourage yourself to use your non-dominant arm or your weaker arm when doing the Wii. Also, there are different exercises you can do in the pool. Um, now, if you have MS, most people have sensitivity to um, heat. So you want a pool that's more um, in the 80s as far as uh, temperature. So some of the different gadgets you can get for the pool are those paddles you see in the top of this picture. And the paddles, the flywheel part of it, can open or close depending on how much you resistance you want from that paddle. So these are paddles that you would hold in your hands as you're doing arm exercises to provide you a little resistance. Also, the aquatic therapy dumbbells that are on the bottom of the picture there. Um, they also can be used to provide resistance in the water, or they can be used to balance yourself. So sometimes I'll have patients who can walk across the pool, but their balance is off, and they'll have one of these flotation dumbbells in either hand, and it's just enough to keep them balanced. If, you're, if your limbs are really weak and you're, you're having difficulty moving in the water, what you can do is use the flotation noodles to support whatever weak area you have. So in this picture, the woman has the flotation noodle underneath her pelvis just to keep her balanced in a, a supine position. But you could also put the flotation noodle under the arms or under the legs if you needed just a little more support in those limbs. Sometimes exercise can be a challenge because it can overheat you, and some people are very sensitive to even a temperature, uh, one or two degree temperature change in their body core. So some options for overheating are cooling vests, and I'll give you resources for that at the end. Um, some low-tech options are uh, spray bottles, if you have a spray bottle handy and can spray yourself down. Um, certainly air conditioning, keeping yourself in an air conditioned environment, or having a personal fan available. And drinking cold water can be helpful too. It can also be helpful to, if you have a cap on, to wet the cap. Or I even had a patient who would come into therapy with a wet t-shirt. Kind of icky, but you know, it was very effective for him. 
so that was fine. Um, in the lower picture, um, the woman is wearing a tie basically around her neck, and this tie I've seen um, at REI, which is a outdoor equipment uh, Facility, uh, outdoor equipment store, and other stores such as that carry this. And basically it's got, I don't know what substance is in it, but you just have to wet that tie and it creates a cooling effect because it can be very effective to cool your neck. That really helps with your core body temperature. And in general, if you are going to an exercise pool, ideally you want the pool to be no more than 80 to 84 degrees, which may sound cold, but it's basically like an outdoor pool, one of those pools you have to just get yourself in and then you're comfortable. Um, so that's the ideal temperature. Also, when you are going to a pool to exercise, if it's an indoor pool, you want to be really cognizant of what the atmosphere is like. Sometimes the rooms in a pool area can get very heated too, so that can be a problem. So uh, some activities to work on your balance. Again, this is showing pictures of the Wii and different ways to adapt that activity is you can use an assistive device such as a walker to stand up and do some of the balance exercises for the Wii. And in the lower picture you can see that the gentleman is actually in almost like a push-up position and he's got his hand on the, on the Wii board. So no one says that you have to stand on that Wii board. You can sit on it, you can kneel on it, whatever makes sense in terms of working on your balance. Cardio or endurance equipment. Um, there are several options available for if you want to find an option for uh, cardio exercise in a sitting position. The first picture up there in the top left corner is a woman working on an exerciser. I've had many patients with MS who really enjoyed this piece of equipment. Um, it's generally, exercise equipment is generally not covered by insurance. That can be the challenge. But again, like Julianne said, if you go to Craigslist, eBay, sometimes you can find amazing deals. So the flexercizer, um, her feet are strapped onto pedals and she's moving them with her arms. The top right corner is an uh, arm bike and the bottom, bottom picture is also an arm and leg bike combined and those can also be found in those catalogs that Julianne mentioned. So um, other options for cardio or endurance exercise. Again, a pool is a really good workout. If you get uh, this person in the top picture has an aqua jogger vest, which is a flotation vest, we tend to use that as opposed to a life jacket because life jackets can be pretty cumbersome. So an aqua jogger vest very often is enough flotation for somebody in the deep end and it allows you to go out into the deep end and just basically jog across the pool and get a really good workout like you would on land. The below picture is of an RTI electrical stimulation bike. So for individuals who physically are unable to ride a stationary bike or find it very difficult, what this does is it allows you the option of putting electrical stimulation on your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your gluteal muscles, and then the bike will sequentially stimulate stimulate those to give you a good endurance workout as though you were on a stationary bike. And again, um, exercise can be fun. So the top picture is an example of a hand cycle. Um, actually, both pictures are examples of hand cycles. The top picture is one um, that you can sit in in an upright position. The bottom one is a little more streamlined. Um, and these are options that you can take out on the road and, and exercise with your family. Some winter fun. Um, the top picture is a picture of sit skiing, and the bottom picture is a picture of cross-country skiing. Certainly there are also adaptations that can be made if you choose to ski standing up. There are some extra outriggers that could be used to assist with your balance. And also there are similar adaptations for sit-down skating as well. 
So resources, um, Julian mentioned the top one, PattersonMedical.com. The second one, Access to Recreation is a really great resource. Julian had mentioned some hooks and loops that you can use to access some strength training equipment to, if you're unable to physically hold on to it. And you can find those in Access to Recreation. And then the, sprinting, the sprintaquatics.com is a source for those pool exercise equipment that I showed you. And restorativetherapies.com is the website for the RTI bike. And then the cooling vest, one of the more popular cooling vests, is from polarbearcoolers.com. And I thank you for your attention, and I think we can start taking questions. Wonderful. Thank you to both of you. And yes, as always, we are getting some great questions this evening. Um, one question that I have is regarding a treadmill. I had a few people ask about that. Um, one person is wondering if a cane can be used on a treadmill set at a walking speed, and if you have any um, maybe suggestions for individuals with balance issues. A cane could be used on a treadmill. However, I would strongly encourage somebody to use uh, to get a treadmill that has um, good handrails to hold on to instead. Because in my mind, the, the benefits of a treadmill is to be able to get on one and not worry about your balance. So holding on to a firm handrail that's part of the treadmill is going to be much more secure than using a cane on it. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, this is a good one. What helps sense intensity um, of the exercise if you have a loss of sensation? I guess they're just wondering how, how can they tell um, if the exercise is helping or if they're maybe doing it the intensity they should. Uh, well, one of the, um, are they talking mostly I think about uh, uh, aerobic exercise, but if we, if we are talking about aerobic exercise, um, I heard through the, the Can Do program, um, one of the physicians that we work with gave a tremendous example of how hard you should be exercising. So if you're doing um, aerobic exercise and you can recite the poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb, you should, the, the way to tell that you're exercising at the right intensity for you is if you can say, Mary had a little lamb, <gasps> draw a breath. Its fleece was white as snow, <gasps> you need to draw a breath. And everywhere that Mary went, <gasps> draw a breath. But if you can recite the whole thing before you have to draw a breath, you're not exercising hard enough. If you go, Mary <gasps> had <gasps> a little, <gasps> then you're exercising too hard. And I've, it's <laughs> stuck with me forever, and it's very pragmatic and fun, and it's a great way to know how the intensity is just for you. Thank you. Um, I had a few people ask it about equipment. Um, one individual asked if you've heard of something called motion therapeutics. Uh, it sounds like it's a balance wear um, stability garment that kind of that will help treat balance issues. And I don't know if um, you both have heard of that, and if you have any um, suggestions. Um, yes, we we use that here at Casa Colina periodically. Um, the woman who who created it is out here in California. Um, we don't exactly know how, why it works, um, so, but we do have a sense of how to evaluate somebody for it. And basically it's a vest that you wear that has very light weights on it quarter inch to, I mean a quarter pound to half pound weights. So we don't really put a lot of weight on the vest. And we determine through evaluation where to place that, the weights. Um, should it be, you know, down by your hip, up by your shoulder, on your right side, your left side, that sort of thing. And you can go online and see some pretty amazing videos. So there are some people who have wow experiences that it really ground, grounds them and gives them a lot more stability. Um, and there are some people who have so-so experience with it. Um, it can be covered by some insurance companies. It also You can also get it with a um, firm lumbar piece to it so it can be coated by... Um, the orthotist as a back support, so sometimes it can be covered by insurance. 
Thank you. Um, another question that I received is, um, it's called a paraladder, and um, sounds like it, it can assist you with getting in and out of a wheelchair or a scooter and so on. And they're wondering if you have recommendations for the paraladder. If either one, of, if either one of you do. I've never actually used one. No. Yeah, I'd have to say I'm I'm not entirely familiar with with what it is. Oh, sorry. It's, it sounds like we got a kind of a stump question there. Um, but yeah, it, they were just asking about that equipment. Um, let's move on to another question. Is what sort of exercise would or how to exercise uh, for an individual who doesn't have mobility is maybe um, bedridden or is in a wheelchair? So the best exercise for someone in a wheelchair, um, you can consider the pool because um, that certainly unweights people enough that sometimes they can get more exercise there. Um, you know, the arm bike, if they still have use of their arms, could be a very good workout. Mm -hmm. And I would second that with Kathy that the pool is, is really a great way uh, to gain exercise um, in that particular situation. And um, oftentimes here in Denver, we have um, some people who volunteer at local pools um, who help people with dressing and undressing and, and um, getting in and out of the pool. Um, and their, their assistance is just invaluable. And so if there's a program like that or people um, available like that that you can use, they're, they're specially trained. Um, that that's really helpful, and you don't have to waste as much energy um, with that aspect of swimming. Thank you, both of you. Uh, another question that I have is, um, what questions should I ask a PT or an OT in order to get the most from my treatment? Um, are there questions that individuals should be asking when they're going to OT and PT uh, um, therapy? Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm a hmm on that one too, Kathy. <laughs> I guess maybe um, one of the first things that sort of popped into my head was um, you might want to inquire about their experience in working with MS symptoms and people who have MS. Um, you know, if someone, not to say that someone wouldn't have a good idea that hasn't had a lot of experience with it, but but maybe just getting an idea of of how comfortable and familiar they are. That that was kind of the first thing that popped into, into my head. And also um, just making sure you have a clear understanding of what impairments they've discovered in, your, the, in evaluating you so you know what areas could be worked on. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that we have is, um, Suggestions for equipment uh, with with gait training. Um, there, this person is wearing an AFO um, on his or her right leg, the right leg, and just wondering if there's something that maybe they could do at home as well. So, so something besides the AFO. Hmm. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it, it totally depends on the degree of impairment, um, how how weak exactly that ankle is. If someone needs an AFO, but then they want to practice walking without it, the concern is that they may twist their ankle. So usually we'll recommend that if someone wants to practice in the house without an AFO, that they at least get one of those um, firm braces that you would use for a sprained ankle, a twisted ankle. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, finding the best time of day to exercise, should you try and break it, it, is it okay to break it up and do a little in the morning and a little at night, or should it be done all at once, or um, in suggestions for that? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and really there is no um, set time that, that is actually best um, per se. 
Um, it's probably the time when you feel the best, when you may have some of your best energy is a good time to exercise. Um, even sometimes exercise will help stimulate your energy. So it depends upon on you and, and how you have responded to exercise in the past and how you respond to it now. So sometimes if you're having a lull, um, a little bit of light aerobic exercise can really uh, re- reduce your system. Um, and then other people, that doesn't work so much at all. So it's something of a trial and error. But um, you know, I'll let Kathy talk about some of the cardiac benefits. You know, I think what we've been hearing recently is 20 minutes is really um, adequate. And if you did that one in the morning and one in the afternoon, um, you may not even have to do two or 10 in the morning and 10 in the afternoon. But I'm going to bat that one over to Kathy a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and and also it depends on what else is going on in your day. You know you wake up with a certain energy budget, so you really have to prioritize mm-hmm. where to use that budget. So that may also dictate that, oh, maybe I should save the exercise for later on and see if I have the, the energy for it by then. Um, if somebody is very sensitive to temperature changes in their core body temperature, then they may find it better to exercise in the morning when our body temperature is cooler. Um, If you live in a hot climate like California, you also have to exercise in the morning because it doesn't really cool down at night either. Um, So that could be uh, a factor as well. And also as far as uh, back to the question of how much is enough exercise, One rule that I've heard over the years is that after you exercise, you should make a point of resting for a while, doing some sort of sit-down activity for an hour or so, and then at the end of the hour, you should feel okay again. If you feel like you're still wiped out, then perhaps you did a little too much in that exercise program. Thank you, both of you. Um, Another question that I have is, this is an individual, excuse me, individual who can use um, only the right side. Um, how can they exercise using only one side without stressing the good side? Mm-hmm. So I think what's important is to watch your form, that you don't want to be torquing your body trying to compensate for the fact that your other side isn't doing the movement. So you may need to keep... If you're doing strength training and such, you may need to keep the the resistance, the weights down a little bit so that you're not creating such a huge imbalance between your body or torquing your body to try to get the exercise accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I would um, say, too, that, again, water um, is a wonderful way um, to to exercise in in a kind of a non-challenging or gentler way but still be a really powerful um, exercise and flexibility tool. Thank you. Uh, another question that I have: um, We've had a, I have a few people that asked about um, equilibrium and vertigo and trying to exercise. Um, do you have suggestions for exercises or, or what those individuals can maybe do? Well, first of all, it's important to distinguish vertigo from from unsteadiness, from dizziness. Vertigo generally means the room is spinning. Um, and I guess, actually, to be more succinct, I, I think the best thing would be to get a physical therapy evaluation because you really want to know where is the dizziness or the vertigo and the feeling of unsteadiness, where is it coming from? Is it coming from your inner ear? Is it coming from um, your brain processing the information? And we use three sensory inputs to keep our balance. We use our vision. We use our sensation of our feet being firm on the ground. And we use our inner ear. And there are some tests a physical therapist can do to see where of those three are you having the most problem. And then they can give you some exercises to focus on that. Great, thank you. Um, I've also had a few people ask about um, either getting motivation or trying to stay motivated when um, they're having a flare-up. Um, do you have suggestions for people that are um, just struggling with getting motivated to exercise or to, to get back into it? Well, 
Well, I think with, if the, someone is having a flare-up, then I think the main concern is, um, you know, how much should they be exercising versus conserving their energy. And so you may need to look at your exercise program to have like a good day, bad day exercise program type of thing. Um, as far as general motivation to exercise, I think you need to establish a goal. You know, why are you choosing to exercise and what is your goal? What I think you may find is that if you become disciplined and and stick to the exercise routine, eventually it becomes a fix where you just have to exercise. But the other thing, too, is to establish a realistic exercise program. You know, everyone says, oh, you know, you should be out doing something every day. Well, you know, if that's not realistic, that you're not going to stick to that. Don't make New Year's resolutions you can't stick with type of thing. Um, so you also have to be realistic as far as what's going to fit into your lifestyle and your energy budget. Well, well said. Um, I concur with that. And, and the other thing I might add is, um, making sure that you can keep your your um, exercise program um, interesting to you is is also helpful. So, you know, if you're becoming really bored, or, oh man, I just don't want to do the same thing over and over again, um, putting some variety in so that you know maybe one day your exercise is a yoga class, or another day is to go to the pool, or adding some novelty of some kind, maybe incorporating the Wii in um, if you haven't done that before. And then another thing might be to uh, rope a friend into it with you so that you are meeting up with somebody or at least having someone come to your house and exercise together. And sometimes that's a a really great way to um, get yourself off the bubble um, and and start moving forward. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a question. uh, Just uh, this person wondering, you know, for example, house cleaning or you're walking to and from your office and you're going up and down stairs, um, does that count as exercise? Or can it count as exercise, should I say? Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I often wonder that too. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I think we've all been told that it is that it's good. It strengthens your legs. It's a good cardiac workout. But I think unless you're like climbing stairs for ten minutes, um, which I'm, I can I can assure you, I I would hate to have to do. Um, that that isn't really um, a good choice for aerobic exercise or cardiac exercise. Um, and and really, it comes down to how do you want to use your energy. If if you if you have the extra energy to use the stairs and and you feel okay with that and it's fine and you have extra energy to then go ahead and and get into an exercise program then that's fine, um, but if stairs tend and and everything we do during the day in terms of energy is cumulative, um, like like spending money is cumulative when we're when we're withdrawing it from our bank account. Um, if if stairs tend to make you, if you're really tired at the end of the day, you might want to cut out taking the stairs um, and see what happens. And if that gives you or saves some energy um, to actually do a, a structured exercise routine, that would actually be a better choice um, and have more far-reaching effects for you. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that statement that um, I always try to impress them on my patients that life shouldn't be one big exercise. So, um, you know, some people will choose not to get a shower chair because they feel they should be standing in the shower. Well, that's not a place yeah. to exercise. You should be enjoying the shower. And the right. same thing, like Julianne was saying about the stairs, um, going up and down the stairs, if that is challenging, well, then it shouldn't be part of your everyday routine. It should be part of an exercise program because then you can control your energy budget a little better as well. And also, if balance is an issue, then, um, you know, I had one one client who said, well, you know, I have trouble putting my pants on standing up because of my balance, so I think I should keep working on that. And I said, well, no, you should put that in an exercise program. So again, not everything in life should be an exercise. If you have certain things that you feel you should work on, put them in part of your exercise program, not necessarily your everyday life. Great, that was um, that was a wonderful answer from from both of you. Um, I have just one more equipment. 
question. I think we're kind of running out of time. But um, this person asked about a sit-to-stand glider and using that in an exercise program. Um, do you have any familiarity with that? Um, well, I believe if they're talking about the standing glider, it was in one of the pictures of the standing table. Um, and that is a very good for form of exercise. Not only are you standing and stretching, but it, the glider has um, uh, things for your arms so you can move your legs with your arms, like a walking motion. So yeah, that is a good exercise. Okay, great. Um, and I'm just looking, trying to watch the time here, and just I think we are actually out of time for questions. So. Um, again, thank you um, Julianne and Kathy for um, doing the presentation this evening and for answering all of these questions. And thanks to everyone who joined in with us this evening. Um, as always, great questions. So, I, and before we go, I'd like to take a moment to share um, Can Do MS's newest program with you, Take Charge. And Take Charge is a weekend retreat where both participants living with MS and their support partners can participate in lectures, workshops, group activities, and, and group interaction. And the program will take place June 21st to June 23rd in Charleston, West Virginia, um, if there's anyone in the audience who's in that area. Um, the program is free to participants, minus a $50 application fee, and your own travel fees to and from the program location. But for more information, please visit mscando.org. Um, we have that listed under Programs, and you'll see Take Charge. And this is a new program, and as it grows, we will be um, having more of these programs around the country. Uh, the next monthly webinar will be on May 14th at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and the topic is Environmental Factors. And our special presenters that evening will be Pat Kennedy, Registered Nurse, and Dr. Deborah Miller, Licensed Independent Social Worker. So please join us live from the convenience of your home or office at no charge to you. You can register for the Can Do MS webinars at mscando.org under Programs. And for those participating live tonight, once the presentation is over, you'll see a survey appear on your computer screen. And if you could please take a moment to complete the survey, uh, that helps us to continue to improve our webinars, and we value everyone's feedback and input. And everyone will also receive a copy of tonight's webinar slides by email tomorrow. So thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. <laughs>